Land. Thank you so much for joining us here today. I am so excited to be here. Uh, my name is Maria Wickvila. I'm a 2005 graduate of Harvard Business School, and I am now entering my 17th year of giving admissions consulting advice. Uh, I am the founder of applicantlab.com. So I don't know if you've had a chance yet to look at what admissions consultants charge, but their packages tend to start at around $4,000, $5,000. Uh, and their hourly rates, at least for people of my caliber, start at around $350 to $450 per hour. What I've done with applicantlab.com is I have taken all of the advice that's in my head and I have turned it into an interactive platform that guides you through the full MBA admissions process for less than the cost of one hour of what the other consultants want to charge you. So if you're a DIY roll up your sleeves type, please do check it out. But Let's move on to why we are here today. Today, we have four prospective applicants to business school. Uh, and what we're going to do today is we are going to take a quick look at their profiles and talk a little bit with each one about what their aspirations are, uh, what their backgrounds are, and which schools might be the best fit for them. So first, what I'm going to do is I'm going to ask each person to introduce themselves, uh, just sort of a quick little intro to who you are. And then we're going to go back and then dig into each person individually. So Samir, uh, Let's start with you. Great. Thanks, Maria. Uh, so my name is Samir. I am someone who's been born and brought up in Delhi. I'm an electrical engineer by profession. But for the last four years, I've been working in an edtech startup and currently heading the operations for a particular business channel. All right. Excellent. Uh, Vids, you're next. Hi, Maria. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank you for doing this. It uh, really helps uh, some kind of benchmark and, you know, we can uh, carry forward from here. Just a bit about myself. I completed my, uh, I graduated around five years ago and I've been working since then. And, uh, yeah, I think we can go into my profile details later, but thank you. Excellent. Yes, you're, you've been five years in healthcare consulting, I think it says here. Excellent. All right, next we've got Abhijit. Yep. So uh, thank you, Maria. I would like to take this opportunity to thank you, uh, applicantlab.com, as well as Nikhil, who has given me the opportunity to present myself and I will uh, get my profile evaluated. So I'm a mechanical engineer. Uh, I was, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm born in India and currently I'm working in Japan uh, in one of the top three automotive giant. Uh, yeah, I would say that uh, that's enough for uh, my introduction as of now. All right, excellent. And then our final person is Anonymous M. Uh, please introduce yourself. Yeah, hi everyone. So uh, fun fact about me, I've lived uh, across 11 states in India. And uh, also I've done my graduation from one of the new IITs that was opened in 2008. And I plan to apply this year uh, for B schools. Thanks. Thanks, Maria. Okay, excellent. So with those intros out of the way, uh, let us start with Samir. Let's dig in a little bit more. Oh, look at this. this is a nice little picture. Um, <laughs> so let's jump into Samir's background. Am I able to move the slide? I am able to move the slide. Look at this. Technology is great. Okay, so Samir, we're going to start with you. Okay, so uh, you are 29 years old. You are an electrical engineer. And as you said during your introduction, you've been at an ed tech startup now for about four years. So I think one of my first questions is, you know, you said you're in, you're handling the P&L responsibility. Um, can you share, you don't have to share like exact revenue numbers for us, but in terms of the general sort of size of the company, how successful has the company been? Are there any metrics you can share in terms of numbers of users or uh you know high profile investors who may have invested in the startup or have revenue numbers sure. a certain amount sure sure so uh like i said i joined this particular startup around four years back at that time we had only around 20 25 employees right now the company has grown to almost 600 employees oh, wow. we have more than fifty thousand customers across india and recently we've started operations across the globe as well. So right now what I'm working on is launching the product in the US market. And in terms of investors, uh, we are backed by Sequoia and 
Google Capital. Oh wow. Okay. So these are this is a really uh, this is great, right? Because I think a lot of people when when you're working in admissions, right, and you see someone say, "Well, I work for a startup," you have no idea as an admissions reader is that startup like you've been sitting alone in your garage for a couple of years, kind of just messing around and watching Netflix and calling it a startup, or is it a legitimate startup that has gotten traction in terms of revenue and users and investors? And so definitely this profile or this uh, company seems like it has gotten some really excellent, uh, some really excellent traction, like between Sequoia and between the international expansion and the 600 going from 25 to 600 employees is a, is a pretty big jump. Uh, and so you say you involved handling PL responsibility and team building and business development, which, so would you say that your primary role is one of business development? Yeah. So, uh, like for almost a year or two years, I was heading the city operations, which involved running the business for that particular city, uh, be it supply, be it demand generation, be it revenues, be it cost optimization, everything. Mm -hmm. So that is what I was doing for almost one, one and a half years. And right now for our US operations, for getting this product into the market, right now we are focusing on building the team, but then eventually within the next couple of months, we want that to be a full-fledged business channel and i'll be heading that particular channel okay that's really interesting so the other thing that i like about this this profile is not only i mean clearly the company is doing well or you wouldn't be expanding uh but that you even though you were an engineer by training you were able to transition into a business leadership role uh and you've had p l you've had impact on both the the PNL stands for profit and loss for those of you who might not know that. So you've had impact on both the P, which is like the revenues coming in, but also the losses like trimming down or running the operation. So I think that your work experience um, is, is pretty strong. Like I, you know, assuming that you have really been able to have an impact in the expansion of the company and or enhancing its profitability, which it sounds like you have. Uh, I think that this is a pretty, a pretty strong, profile coming in in terms of that leadership really having that leadership impact and really showing the admissions committee like look you guys are looking for future business leaders and boom look at how look at the evidence that i'm presenting to you that i actually have the potential to become a future business leader because look at the business accomplishments i've had already so i think that's a really strong uh strong work profile so let's jump to the next section which are your post mba goals so working in operations at a place like amazon and then CXO position where you can just run a business and build a global brand. So we need to dig a little bit more deeply into this because one of the big places where a lot of really well qualified candidates run into trouble in the admissions process is that they present sort of either vague goals or goals that don't entirely make a ton of sense giving like where was the person in the past and where do they want to go in the future like do those two things connect um and the reason why this matters in the admissions process is that mba programs want to be certain that the alumni of that program are happy with the decision to have pursued that degree right that they're happy with the investment right because especially if you're if you are talk, uh, targeting some of these us programs in particular you may have to take out 150,000 200,000 us dollars in loans to attend that program and so they want to make sure like okay at the other side is this person going to get that job that they say that they want and so i think one i've got two sort of comments here and then maybe we can talk about these a little to try to refine them i think the long term goal right now is just way too vague a cxo position i mean the x would be so many different things uh, and then also like where you can run a business and build a global brand like that could be a makeup company that could be an, a self-driving car company that could there could be a, a global brand could be a whole bunch of things so i I think uh, given that your expertise so far has been in ed tech, my advice would be to keep your post MBA goals in the education realm. Uh, because if you already have experience in something, then it, it's more likely that, you know, someone like a Khan Academy or the education division of Google or some sort of more relevant employer in the education space is more likely to look at your profile and say, wow, this is the guy we want to hire. Um, and so I think 
in terms of your application strategy, I think you really need to come up with something that's very much more specific for the long term. I would build upon your current experience at the EdTech startup to sort of create a path that makes sense. Um, and so given that, I also think that the short term working and operations at a place like Amazon, like the jump, if that is what you want to do short term, making the jump from doing PL stuff at an ed tech startup to doing operations at an e-commerce company, let's talk through what is what is the rationale for wanting to switch both industry and function? Right. So uh like one of the major reasons for that is I don't want to get stereotyped or you know typecast into one particular domain. That is one thing. Uh, another thing is that right now, as far as edtech is concerned, given my past experience, I know how things work. So I would rather use that experience and use my MBA experience to go to a place where I can learn something new. Mm -hmm. Probably you know something completely different which I have not done before. Right. So that was the rationale behind it. The third reason is because I've been in a startup, I would probably want to see how big corporations or big global brands work because obviously their way of operating will be very different to how we operate. So kind of learn tricks and trades from them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I get that that's what you want to do in, in real life, but I think, uh, there's what you want to do in real life and then there's what you want to say in the application right so the application process is so competitive that you don't want to give the admissions reader a reason to stop and say well wait a minute is this guy like wait what why operations and eco wait is he going to get that job like is amazon going to look at this, someone who's had p l responsibility and say yes this is someone we need in an operations role right or that i don't want them to have any moment of uh, the phrase is cognitive friction. I don't want there to be a moment where there's like that sort of record scratch moment in their heads where they go, wait, wait, what? Amazon operations, right? So I think in real life, go like the, you know, I tell people all the time, the minute you set foot on campus, or I mean, if it's virtual, hopefully next this time next year, it won't be virtual. Uh, but the minute you log into that first Zoom meeting for classes, uh, you can do whatever you want. You can pursue real estate. You can try to work for Louis Vuitton. You can do whatever. But for the purposes of the application, it's such a competitive process that why why create even a moment of like, huh? In the admissions reader's mind, you want them to just sort of glaze over the career vision and be like, uh huh, yeah, that makes sense. Can he get that job? Yeah, he'll get that job. So your own personal reasons for wanting to pursue an operations role at Amazon, I you know. From a career, I'm, I'm an admissions coach, not a career coach. So that would be up to you to decide if that is a good use of your time. It might, uh, on the one hand, it might be really good to expand your skill set. But on the other hand, if you are really good at building businesses, you should probably stick to that. <laughs> to that, And it would probably be more, you know, perhaps more lucrative in the long term uh, for you to stick with what you're good at. But that's not my role. My role is admissions. And in terms of admissions, I would want you to, I would want to see something like, working for I, I like the big company thing i think that's a great point but like working for the education division of an apple or um that's sort of more hardware focus sometimes but i think they might also be doing things with apps but really trying to, to narrow it down to something that will build logically upon your previous experience maybe that is uh, perhaps more of a product manager role if you were to try to sort of uh, say like, well, I've helped, I've helped grow the business itself, but I don't have a lot of experience with product. Uh, that could be a good, a good post MBA type of goal for you to pursue. Uh, but I would, I would look into something ed tech related. And for the long term, I would also stick with ed tech and, and find some, some facet of that. Don't just say, I want to start an ed tech company, but, uh, or be a senior leader at an ed tech company, but really kind of try to figure out, is it test prep? Is it literacy? Is it, Financial literacy, like what do you, ed tech's a pretty broad uh, umbrella. Right. So, right. okay, target target MBA programs, Wharton Booth, Ross, Tuck, NSAID and Haas. Um, so it's interesting, I think, so your GMAT's a 720. Um, so I, I definitely think, you know, one of the tricky things with Indian engineers is that Indian engineers tend to do really well on the GMAT. And so the you're gonna be compared against other people who are also, engineers from the startup world. Um, so the good news is I do think that your professional accomplishments are significantly stronger than a lot of other people 
who are who are coming from a similar academic profile, the GMAT's a little bit on the low side. So I do think, look, I definitely think you should apply to Wharton uh, and and Booth and and those schools for sure. Uh, Wharton Wharton has the semester in San Francisco, which might be a really fun thing for you to do if you are interested in tech. You can go there and you know interact interface with tech companies directly. Uh, Booth, I don't really know that their offerings would be. I guess it would have. I would have to know like exactly what you want to major in at Booth. It would be. Uh, that would be interesting for you. Ross, I think is I think is good. Tuck, you know, look in look cast a more critical eye towards Tuck. Uh, I don't. Tuck is really famous for having a really strong alumni network and a really passionate alumni network, but I don't I don't see it as being a huge tech tech feeder. Um, so really, you know, it's it's up to everyone to look at the individual electives that every school offers. So for example, a Kellogg, once you start digging into Kellogg, you'll notice, and this is something that impresses me so much about Kellogg, they have both a product management major and like a product marketing track. So they actually have so many sort of tech or innovation offerings that they split it out into those two buckets. Other schools might just have like the one digital innovation course. Um, and so I don't want you to pick a school that you go to and then you show up and you're like, oh my God, there's nothing here for me. <laughs> like there's only one class that actually is going to help me. And the school is really good at real estate or they're really good at analytics, but that's not what I need. So off the top of my head, I don't, I don't know that I think of Tuck as a strong tech school. INSEAD is interesting because I think uh, INSEAD, I don't know that INSEAD would allow, well, since it is a shorter program without a summer internship, it can make, it may be a little bit more difficult to get that um, that career switch from an INSEAD. Uh, and Haas, Haas is a great option for you. I just worry that Haas is kind of small. And so since Haas is small, by definition, they can only take a certain number of people. So I would add to your list um, a Cornell because Cornell actually has it's, it's close-ish to New York City. It's not super close, but they also have the Cornell Tech Program, which is a one-year uh, tech-focused MBA in New York City that I think could really help you, uh, you know, fill in some of those digital leadership gaps. Uh, and in terms of, uh, especially if secretly you want to work at Amazon, Cornell is a huge pipeline school to Amazon, as is Ross. Um, and then maybe just to sort of round out the risk, also maybe look at a, at a Tepper at Carnegie Mellon. For INSEAD, it's interesting. I would, if you do want to apply there, I would wait until you've at least started the US expansion because INSEAD really values people with international experience. So if you don't yet really have a ton of international experience, at least wait till you've started to get that under your belt. So that way you can write about it in your application. Uh, and then finally, your extracurricular is that you are a, a Pokemon Go player. I mean, I think that's it's it's sweet, but I, I it's a little um, you know I, I worry about how that will come across. You know, if you are going to write about it, I think focus on this engagement, launching these community activities for people, and the logistics behind that. And you know, I organized a meetup for four hundred people, or I helped you know, anything that shows this kind of organizational or managerial things, because I think having a hobby of playing a video game is not, you know, it, it may not be the sort of uh, activity that by itself, just the playing of the video game is not something that I think an admissions committee would be like, wow, this is great. But at least if it's given you an opportunity to show some sort of community leadership in terms of building a community, then I think it could be, I think you could focus on that facet of it instead. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, just one follow-up question I had with respect to the schools uh, is like giving the GMAT again an advisable thing or should I go with the same score? Yeah, so I think I th well, this is I'm not I'm not trying to answer your question with a question, but I would say to you, do you do you in your gut feel that if you were to study again for another two months and give it another go that you could get, say, like a 750? And some people will say, no, Maria, I left it all on the table the last time. That's as high as I'm going to go. I don't think I'm going to do any better. Then in that case, move on. But if somewhere in your gut, you're like, well, you know, I could have studied a little more. I, you know, I really, then if you think you could get at least sort of say a 30 point bump, uh, then I would, I would, I would 
choose, I would look into that for sure. Okay, okay, great. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Maria. No problem, Samir. All right, now we are moving on to vids. One, two, three, four, five. Hi, vids, how's it going? Hey, hi, Maria. Okay, so I think, am I, Abhijit, am I the one moving it to the next? I don't think I can actually control these slides, but I can start reading because I have a printout of your slide right here. Um, okay, so you are an engineer. Oh, you have worked for five years in healthcare consulting, correct, right? So you um, yes. were four years at a prominent healthcare consulting firm with a promotion. Oh, okay, it looks like it's loading up now. Great. Uh, four years with, with a promotion, and now you switch to a higher managerial role at another healthcare firm. So right off the bat, I like that you've been consistent in your career, right? You definitely have a clear focus on healthcare. That helps build a much stronger story than people who have bounced around from different roles to you know different industries and things like that. Um, so one of my first questions about your work experience is when you say that you've like, and perform diagnostics and you've suggested improvements to the line of business. A lot of times for people who do consulting, a, a lot of the, the application strength hinges upon what is the sort of magnitude of impact that you've been able to have on your clients, right? Because some people do consulting and it's like, well, I helped improve efficiency by 2% and other people do consulting and it's like, I helped them launch a brand new product that double their revenue right so you know it, a lot of times it's, it's not just about like oh so this person works in consulting but it's more they work in consulting and look at how much impact they've had so my first question for your work experience is when you suggest improvements to your clients are they operational improvements are they revenue marketing improvements can you talk a little bit about the impact that you've had Yeah, yeah. So I think it uh, like uh, based on my experience, it spans across, uh, you know, maybe like the st strategy point of it as well as the operations. So the first part would be getting the clients uh, onboarded. So that is also something I have worked on where I was a part of uh, a team, uh, uh, you know, onboarding uh, uh, high value uh to the uh, to the company so i think that and i i think i have a number also for that uh like you know about uh, i think in the range of 400 since it was an mnc so uh that was uh, i think that could be like the first part where i helped onboard clients and then once you kind of onboard the clients there's also the part of you know uh, meeting them uh, maintaining the standards of uh, let's say operational uh, efficiency wise so that has been there too so i think uh, you know i can definitely add uh, certain points like you mentioned about uh, in improving the operational efficiency or maybe providing uh, better dashboards uh, to the clients which you know help them gain more insights along those lines Right. And, and, and to the point of something like a dashboard, it's important to just say, not to say, well, I built a dashboard that was made it easier. But if you can then try to somehow quantify, like because of this new dashboard that I built, they were able to identify a cool new market to enter. And then when they did that, it helped improve their revenue. Oh, bids, I think we lost you. Oh, you're back. Um, so I don't know if yeah, you were, sorry, you heard me. did you hear what I, the part I just said, or did we lose you? I think we're, we're yeah i could hear you okay perfect no i could hear you i could hear you yeah so, yeah my laptop was uh discharging so i just had to charge <laughs> i've been there <laughs> um so Sorry. so i think in terms of in terms of saying like in terms of talking about like what you do it's more important to talk about what the impact is has been of your action so instead of saying well i helped onboard a client that's fine but like is there anything you do like in terms of onboarding the client because you're so good at onboarding clients you're able to save them money because the team is able to start working faster. And so they don't have to pay as much uh, for your consulting fees. Or uh, I built a dashboard and that dashboard uncovered a new opportunity for them or things like that. Like it's more about like thinking through, and even if you don't know for sure what the impact has been because your client isn't sharing it with you, conveying to the reader, like, look, my I don't just give suggestions, but my suggestions are good. 
And my suggestions have actually helped my client either reduce costs, increase profit, or had some sort of bottom line impact. Any place in your resume where you can quantify that impact or describe that impact is going to be much stronger than simply saying, well, I built a dashboard. Do you see what I'm saying? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So post MBA plans, I want to expand my expertise to other branches of consulting, maybe even a public sector arm. So I don't know if you were listening to uh, the little the little soapbox I stood on for to talk to Samir about his career goals, but I think it's best for the purposes of admissions to stick with what you know. Uh, and yeah. so I think you should say for for admissions purposes. I want to continue to either advance in healthcare consulting and go to a higher level, maybe transition to a more, stay in healthcare consulting, but transition to a more of a strategic consulting role. If, if what you're doing right now is more sort of operations, dashboard, mm -hmm. PI monitoring, stuff like that. Or it could be, I want to go to business school to then work in, let's say, operations for a healthcare firm, like, you know, Healthcare, healthcare is pretty big, so it could be insurance, it could be pharmaceuticals, it could be hospital management. But so wherever, wherever most of your experience has been, let's say it's been pharmaceuticals, maybe you want to go into a post MBA rotational program with a major pharmaceutical company. You know, so I would either go with the, I want to continue in consulting and I need the MBA to advance, or I want to go and now I want to go to industry and work directly for a client, and then move up the ladder in a pharmaceutical company does that how does that sound yeah so uh, so maria maybe like the narrative that i was trying to propose was uh, you know uh, kind of combine my uh, healthcare consulting uh, experience and then i've done a lot of uh, uh, volunteer work as well and uh, you know i kind of wanted to find that overlap between consulting and uh, having a social impact which is where uh, I thought maybe social impact consulting, you know, when I said other domains with the public arm, so something like, like that was a story I was trying to build. Uh, so yeah. Any thoughts right. on that? Yeah. So I think, I think it's a I, look, I mean, the good news is you've, you've done like the, the teach for India stuff. Like you've, you've done some significant volunteer work, so it doesn't ring hollow. The question is, let's say you're aiming for like a Dahlberg, kind of consulting firm, like one of these, yeah. you know, or, or like a bridge span group, which is like the sort of social impact consulting group, you know, yeah. who's, who's more likely to hire someone with your, with your background? Is it a bridge span or is it a ZS associates? Like, is it, you know, like in terms of, in terms of recruiting, making me as a recruiting manager at a school feel more comfortable. I, I do think in real life, for sure, pursue pursue those those uh, social sector consulting opportunities. I I definitely think you could build that narrative for the employers that like, look, I've worked in healthcare. I mean, especially if well, maybe one thing you could do that would be more social sector focused would be to say, I want to work for like the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, right? I want to work for like a public health like where does where does health and social enterprise intersect? That might be yeah. a, another another place, another narrative for you to explore. But in terms of in terms of getting accepted, I would maintain some level of the healthcare because you've got five whole years of experience in healthcare, um, and so it just helps it helps build upon that existing narrative uh, in a strong in a strong way. And then once you get there, you can go again. You can try to get a job at Louis Vuitton or whatever. <laughs> you, know, you, don't have to, you don't have to actually do anything. They're, they're not going to chase you. They don't care uh, because they know that 80% of people end up changing what they say they were going to do in their applications anyway. So uh, for me, it's again, like, I just think admissions is so competitive. Like why, why give them even a moment to say, huh, social, could she do social enterprise? Well, she's done the teach for India stuff, but hmm, let's think about, you know what? I don't want, I don't want even that moment of questioning to enter their heads. I want them to then focus their limited brain energy on the rest of your application where you're you're talking about those leadership impacts and you're writing an essay about the things that you've done to help your clients or to lead your teams or to make your teams work more smoothly or those sorts of things. Okay. Yeah, I'll I'll keep that in mind. Yep. So for your 
uh, ISD, NUS, Ross, and Sir. So just out of curiosity, what Ross I get, because I think Ross does have a strong social impact. Uh, you know, it, I, I associate it strongly with social impact, but Stern was an interesting one. What, did, what was it about Stern that, that, uh, that draws you in? No, I think I, I think it's more uh, like Stern actually was uh, uh, like tech oriented. I think they have a more of uh, that uh, reach. But uh, I think the appeal of maybe New York, uh, that was like one thing where I could maybe have access. So I attended the webinar actually on the MBA fair uh, last week. And uh, they seem to focus a lot on that fact that, you know, they're located in like a central, they're in a central location and access to a lot of uh, you know companies around and it's a very diverse uh, network there right so that was something and i think even maybe uh columbia because uh they did mention there were a lot of electives and i thought maybe i could you know uh, club together uh this uh experience that i uh had in the social sector and then kind of maybe try to uh, build or leverage that through the courses that i do mm -hmm. but uh yeah i think yeah, I think overall, like a formal education, like, you know, uh, that would really help me across different understanding, like how different functions of uh, the business work. So that is definitely like why I would pursue an uh, MBA in the first mm -hmm. place. Okay, great. So I, I think, yeah, so for CBS, another school that has actually a really strong social sector focus to it, and that gives a has a super strong general management introduction program is Yale. So Yale in their first year has a really cool uh, and pretty unique way of approaching teaching business where instead of teaching it through like necessarily like subjects, they kind of do it through like the eye of the consumer or the, like the lens of the consumer or the lens of the investor or the lens of the employee or things like that. So I think I think they have a pretty good uh, general general management thing. I, I'm a, you know, your GPA is really high. I'm a little concerned again about the GMAT um so, so i just sorry sorry to interrupt no i actually haven't given the gmat it's an expected score and i think i can go a bit higher on that as well okay. Maybe I'll conservative yeah That's great uh and then the other thing i would say to you is look at programs because you have such a strong healthcare background look at programs that have strong healthcare programs even if you don't actually want to and even if you don't actually end up doing the healthcare program there because they'll say like, oh, well, we can totally help her because we've got this great healthcare program. So we're more likely to admit her. And then once you get there, you don't actually have to do it. So some schools that have strong healthcare programs that I think could also get you where you are interested in going. I think uh, Duke could be one that you could look at. Um, UNC has a strong healthcare program and they place people into consulting. And then also Emory and Vanderbilt are also good uh, are good healthcare schools. So because you have a healthcare background, it'll resonate with that admissions committee, thus improving your chances. And then whether or not you actually pursue healthcare, well, yeah. No, I mean, uh, it's, uh, like maybe not. You know, as long as there is some kind of impact, or you know, I'm able to work uh, uh, somewhat, maybe let's say in a social impact kind of sector. So I'm okay with healthcare as well. But yeah, I think like uh, till now it was more, uh, you know, proper US or global pharma. Uh, so maybe just a slight switch. So I'm okay with healthcare. I mean, I could definitely explore those uh, schools uh, as well, uh, like you said. Yeah, I think I think that those schools like have both like they have the healthcare focus and but they also yeah. have that sort of more social enterprise stuff um and yeah i think i think the extracurriculars are good i think i think the strongest one is definitely the the teach for india the two years for teach for india um you know the policy briefing for a member of parliament you know that was it was only a month so and policy mm -hmm. You know, to the extent that policy is not as action oriented as standing in a classroom with 20 kids, it's it's policy briefs tend to be a little bit more theoretical. So it's it may not have had the kind of unless if you can say like, well, then the, then the lawmaker implemented my policy brief and here was the result. Then I think it would be a stronger thing. But if it was just sort of like a hey, I think we should do this and then nothing came of it, then it's not. Um, quite as strong but i do like i do like the teach for india so i think those, yeah. are, those are all of my thoughts any any questions uh no i think this was really helpful so i think if i uh just to kind of uh maybe uh conclude it like i think if i bump up my uh gmat score so how like you know uh, i think the 
comparing the demographics like a higher score is uh, expected <laughs> so i think if i can bump that up uh, then yeah i think i should be good with the schools uh, that i have mentioned and plus the ones you've uh, you've suggested thank you thank you maria yeah no problem thank you okay so now that was vince Okay, so now up next we've got Abhijit. Uh, so hi, hi. we are pulling up your thing right here. Okay, so you are working in Japan in engineering for one of the top three yeah. automotive firms. Um, yeah, I can, I can, I don't know which one exactly, but it's it's pretty pretty not not too hard to guess uh, the type of firm that you're talking about. So you were a mechanical engineer. And so can you tell me a little bit about what was your, what is the, you're an HVAC control system specialist. So I am not an engineer. So can you quickly explain what does an HVAC control system specialist do? Actually, what we do is we uh, actually design a system, uh, which is uh, the uh, car air conditioning. So uh, we get the response, uh, you know, the request from customers all around the world, and we try to accommodate that in, that in our car. So we actually add variety of functions, technologies in the car, and we work on that model and get it developed and get it delivered. Yeah. Okay, excellent. And so how many years of experience do you have? Is When you say for more than two years, is that all your experience or did you do something before this? Uh, before uh, coming to Japan, I was working for an IT company in India. Oh. And uh, yes, I worked there for around a half years. And yes, I started there with an IT uh, you know, uh, work, but I ended up working as, as an again, uh, embedded, moving into electronics. And actually, uh, I don't uh, want to, I, I had opportunities, a lot of uh, opportunities uh, related to my uh, engineering background, but I, I, I don't want it to be in a uh, comfort zone. I always uh, challenge myself in every other way. Like uh, when I, before going to uh, first company, the IT company, so I did an internship in a sales company, uh, working there for uh, six months as a sales and marketing engineer, uh, handling a portfolio of uh, three major products. Uh, which, which were particularly from French manufacturer and US manufacturer. So I've had that that were like 3D printers, 3D scanners, and a 3D design software. So I was uh, uh, moving around India and uh, to customer places. Uh, you know, I I did around uh, close to uh, uh, you know, fifty thousand, close to five hundred thousand uh, dollars of business compared to you know, in India, and. Uh, uh, I think that was an internship, but I didn't pursue it as a long term that time. Uh, but I got a lot of insights about business and marketing that time and doing cold calls, getting leads from a uh, you know, variety of our partner companies. And then on, I moved into IT, uh, getting challenged every time and learning new languages. So I learned lang uh, like Japanese and I'm uh, fairly fluent now. And I came to Japan, uh, like with my language skills and my background, I got an opportunity again. And mm -hmm. earlier when I was working in India uh, for a client, uh, fortunately, after coming to Japan, my client called me to work for him, uh, uh, for the client company. And now I am working in the, uh, the company which I was working for earlier. Okay, so so I'm your your audio cut out for just a split second when you were explaining, how many years ago did you graduate from college? Uh, four years. Four years. Oh, four okay. years. oh whew, that's a relief because at first I thought that you had just graduated two years ago and I was about to say like, oh no, you're too young to be applying. Like you have to wait, you have to hold up. Um, okay. So interesting. So, um, I, I really like you look, I mean, moving to Japan and learning Japanese, it's not an easy, <laughs> that's certainly not an easy, uh, task. It's not a, it's not a country. It's not like a language that's super easy to learn or it's not a, you know, it, it's, it can be very difficult to be a foreigner in Japan. So I really, really like that aspect of the story. And so because of that, I do think that like your INSEAD it makes a lot of sense uh, as a school because you definitely have experienced a different culture and you've clearly adapted 
uh, well to it. Uh, but before we jump into the schools, let's, so you want to now, the post-MBA goal is strategic marketing in a tech company. Can you elaborate just quickly on why marketing and what type of tech company? Yes, definitely. I, uh, during, like, from my college days, I am involved in a lot of uh, interpersonal activities uh, moving around. Like, I was, uh, uh, you know, face of my college for the majority of events. I used to talk with other uh, colleges for events. I, I, have, I have also led a team of 15 people. Uh, uh, I have uh, also, uh, that, that, that team, we won internationally. And I was, uh, got a lot of accolades. If I go to my college now, I have a photo there and my trophy, like, uh, uh, lying in my college. So I think that is one of my achievements. I have, uh, again, uh, apart from that, I have uh, done a lot of, uh, you know, customer facing roles. And uh, even while I was in India, I was, I used to be present to Japanese clients in Japan and talking to uh, people. So I think marketing is where I can actually, I'm able to convince people to do something and for I have the tertiary skills. So maybe that I, I where I feel that I could uh, uh, end up very good in uh, future uh, marketing and which I could uh, get from a, a, a good business school. Have, have you so worked in my, marketing? Uh, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. So what you were describing in yeah, terms of yeah, being able to influence others, that to me sounds a little bit more like sales versus marketing. I know it might, I know those two terms yeah. often get lumped together, uh, but marketing is more like, you know, what's the brand and which campaign should we launch? Yeah. Should it be a social media campaign or a TV campaign? Exactly. Um, so yeah. have you ever in your current job had a chance to interface with the marketing department at all? I, what I'm trying to get at is, do you, do you know for sure that you would like working in marketing or is it sort of a speculation on your part? No, actually, I have, uh, I have uh, even, even uh, like uh, uh, my earlier job, I used to handle sales as well as marketing. Going like our marketing strategy was designed from uh, like the France team or maybe from the US, and they used to look a lot of, and we used to move to particular locations, assigning like a gathering, like how we have to go through this event, how we have to like there were a lot of uh, you know expose. Uh, the technology expo where we used to present our product, you know, we used to take opportunities in colleges, we used to go to colleges, we used to go to, uh, you know, company fairs where we can present the product. So I have been a part of that team. So I think I did it fairly good there uh, as a part of like talking to people, explaining the portfolios, you know, getting customer feedback and presenting it to, it to my company. Yeah. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So I think, I think a, a challenge for you or something you need to focus on in your application is really pulling together pretty explicitly those different threads and making it clear to the reader, like, no, I, I have experience in marketing, right? I, I've done it in the past. Um, again, focusing less on giving presentations because again, that's more sales, right? Going to a conference and presenting your work is more about selling as opposed to thinking strategically about the price and the market entry strategy and the stuff around marketing. So I, I'm a little hesitant with mar with marketing as the, as the post MBA um, function. I wonder if something like a, like being a product manager would build a little bit more, it would be broader because being a product manager also involves speaking with, clients and consumers and really getting into their heads and understanding what they're looking for. So there's definitely an element of incorporating marketing data as a product manager and the voice of the customer and the, you know, trying to put yourself in the customer's shoes, but it's not quite as big of a jump as going from designing air conditioning systems to selling a car. Right. So I think, I think from a, from an applications perspective, I, I wonder if product manager might be a slightly, uh, slightly easier sell. And I, and I do think as you've, if, since you've been here listening to me talk now for 40 minutes, uh, I do think that saying something in the automotive, staying in the automotive industry would be beneficial for you as opposed to just saying a tech company. So that's, that's just my take on it. And then in terms of programs, uh, so you've got, <laughs> I noticed that there are no U S programs. Um, is that for like cost yeah. reasons? Is it for, is it for work visa reasons? Is uh, it definitely not. 
no i i am actually looking for learning another language will i i'll able to learn in europe so my uh, first three uh, target schools are uh, european schools in cad hsc paris and iesc yeah i think for i would prefer going to rotman and swiss that is my fourth and fifth preference but yeah i would go to you and study that yeah. okay so i so will be a polyglot in future yeah no it's great and i think so i think uh i think europe's cool also because there are a lot of large car manufacturers in europe uh in germany specifically so if you've already started studying german then i think that that helps you know because if you were to get a job at say a mercedes benz in germany you would probably need to speak german to get that job so um in terms of the applications to business schools i would focus in the next couple of months trying to like get up to a slightly higher level of german and then saying like i'm i'm planning to continue to study german because i want to work in the eu i, I would love to try to work in the eu afterwards perhaps at a german automotive company because those are the most sort of famous ones um and so maybe you might even want to after you apply to these schools on your list uh you know you might even want to throw in an application to one or two german programs in germany so even if those programs are not as kind of highly ranked in the world of rankings think about how much benefit you might get from going to a school in the country it'll force you to learn more of the language it'll be easier for building the contacts and also frankly it may be a less expensive degree um so that that could be sort of like you could you could try applying to all of these programs right now and then maybe look at some of the german schools later just to sort of figure out like the cost benefit and reach out to a ton of students reach out to especially other indian students who are at these schools and basically say like hey what's the job what's the job situation like because i have i have heard anecdotally that if you go to a european program it can be hard to get a job in europe if you don't speak the language so but you've proven that you're a polyglot in terms of learning japanese um so i think you could you know you you could probably learn german if you if you put your mind to it so i think just sort of trying to get up to slightly higher level in german and then making that whole part of your package to the european programs i i hope i think it'll work i hope it'll work <laughs> yeah uh just a uh, question to you uh i just want to know like uh as my uh post mba goal strategy marketing what sort of profile uh update do i have to make to uh, but, uh, ex express myself in that way uh, what role yeah. should i uh, aspire now right now yeah so Can this might be a little bit this might be a little bit tough but if there's any sort of project where you're even interfacing with the marketing department at your company or you're even like you're Okay. you're talking to them or saying to them like hey what do you guys think about air conditioning <laughs> like <laughs> i don't know like anything where you like you're working with them or talking to them or getting exposure to them because that will start to give you a sense of like what is it that they actually do uh because i i just want to be careful i don't want them to think that you're just saying marketing out of a sort of well the grass is always greener on the other side of the fence right sometimes people say things like oh i hate doing engineering i can't wait to get into marketing and then they get into marketing they're like this is even worse than engineering what did i do um so i think i think just trying to get some sort of experience even if it's just you know at the at the at the very minimum maybe just like taking some of the marketing people out to lunch and asking them like so what is your day to day job entail and what makes for a good marketer and who wouldn't want to be a mar like who would be unhappy as a marketer getting that sort of information i think would at least be beneficial so that way you can say in your in your essay like i spoke to three people in the marketing group and based on that i think i would really that's where i want to move next or you could also just apply with a product marketing background with the, sorry with a product marketing story but then pursue a stronger marketing role once you're actually in school all right great that has a lot yeah Okay, excellent. I'm I am glad to hear it. Cool. And so now we are moving on to anonymous M. Okay. 24 years old. Hi anonymous M. Okay. So you are 24. Uh current score 17 targeting 750. Uh IIT with an 8.0. Okay. 
So I experienced 2.5 years at the time of application working at a top fintech company. So can you elaborate a little bit more on, um, in terms of your job at the fintech company, are you an engineer at the fintech company? Are you product so, manager? Yeah. So uh, the fintech company is actually uh, American based and leading uh, in the payments sector. And I'm working in the capacity of a software engineer right now. So, so right now I'm a software engineer, but hoping in the coming three, four months, if things go right, then maybe something happens. But yeah, so currently that's it. And uh, so like development of uh, products from a developer point of view, not overviewing it as such, uh, but like the nitty gritties of how to understand how the product like is created from the developer point of view that is what i'm part of right now uh, not directly interacting with the business owners where we get the information from or the requirements from but yeah that's pretty much it so and my post mba goal actually include product management because i want to actually get the overview of things and then like uh, like be the product management post mba Okay, perfect. Product management. So right now, are you leading other people even indirectly? So yeah, so indirectly, I'm not leading as such anyone. Uh, indirectly, I would say the people. I'm the second year software engineer. So those who have joined the team as first year. So those two people and the interns, those who would have joined the company. So indirectly, I would say four people i'm the like point of contact for them for any information or any knowledge or like their uh, transition from like college to corporate that kind of thing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. okay have you and in terms of your impact to the company like have you identified a new product offering or a new feature that has helped the company you know, access a new market or grow in some way or save it a lot of time or like what? So, so yeah, so I've worked on a project like uh, two, three projects end to end, like uh, leading even one of them, which has had impact in the efficiency of the company because uh, the team I work upon is actually an internal facing team. So we actually cater to the employees of the company. So I can uh, increase the efficiency of that those processes, but I cannot increase, like in my current role, any monetary benefit to the company. Okay, so you're doing sorry, you're doing, you're doing internal. So is it is it like HR, like human resource software that you're doing? Yeah, like, uh, in the, as in the intranet site, the internet website of the company through which any information or like anything which goes on to the users, their top tools or anything like that, sort of that. Okay. So that internal facing website having like 16,000 to 25,000 employees as the uh, users, uh -huh. that is the team I'm working with. Okay. Has anyone else, has any other sort of second year software engineer from your company gone on to get an MBA? Uh, not that I'm aware of. Only one person who was who made the TPM uh, like technical product management very soon. Uh, in I think one year, eleven months, he went to Kellogg. That is I'm aware of. But I don't think in my current batch there is anyone who has done it. Okay. So basically. Yeah, just one point. So I understand maybe the work ex uh, and not having the leadership positions in the working right now may be the point of concern here. But the thing is, I actually already have Indian School of Business uh, in hand as a YLP candidate like, like from college onwards. So I am supposed to be joining this like while I has been next year. So for me, uh, working on the work ex won't be an option. So. So yeah, just like, so I just want to work on everything else, uh, whatever I can. Yeah. Right. Okay. So 
really quickly that that TPM who went to Kellogg, how many years of experience did that person have when they got into Kellogg? So I think uh, so when he went, I think three and a half years when he started college and I think two and a half or like three something when he applied. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think you you sort of sensed where I was going with this line of, of questioning. You know, I, I do think that you have a lot of potential to be a really strong candidate to some of these top US programs, but it would be maybe two more years from now once you are like leading a team or you are a product manager or you're you're able to sort of show that bottom line impact, you know, working on an internal intranet, uh, you know, in terms of like your career vision, you would probably have to talk about wanting to work in some sort of HR consulting. You know, at first I was going to say, oh, well, you should say that you want to work in fintech and fintech is an exciting new business. And NYU actually has a fintech program, uh, a fintech major. Uh, but in fact, you're at a fintech company, but you're not doing fintech programming. Is that correct? So, um, so yeah, so, but I, you know, I, maybe you could apply if you were to apply to like, say an NYU and you could say like, having worked at a FinTech company, I I've been seeing what the other people in my company do. And I think it's really cool. And therefore I want to get an MBA with a focus on FinTech because this is the career I want to keep. I want to keep pursuing. I mean, maybe you could sort of put that story together. Um, I do worry, you know, in terms of getting into really top U.S. business schools, uh, it really does come down to what has what has that leadership impact been. Uh, and so they, when people are really young, when they tend to get into business school, it's because they've already accomplished at the same level of someone who has more experience. So maybe they got an early promotion. Uh, to be a product manager kind of early in their career. So then that way, even though they might only have a couple of years of experience in terms of the amount of responsibility that they've had, they're actually on par with other candidates who have four or five years of experience. Uh, so I'm a little bit concerned that in terms of the leadership facet of your profile, if you really want to apply this year, uh, I do have some concerns about the competitiveness you know, of, of what you've been doing when I think about other people with software backgrounds who are also software engineers who have also gone to IIT, when I think about the people who, who get into, say, a Harvard. Um, like, for example, I did work with someone who was an IIT graduate who did get into Harvard a couple of years ago. I believe this person had about seven years, of six or seven years of experience when they applied, and they were managing an $80 million profit and loss uh, at the time of entering. So I'm not saying like, oh, you have to be in charge of $80 million worth of stuff to get into Harvard. That's not the message, but I'm just saying like, that's the kind of profile that I look at and I'm like, okay, that person has a shot. I'm a little concerned about when I try to think about like your application and what are the things you're gonna talk about in those leadership essays, um, the competitiveness versus other people who, not because they're better people than you, not because they're smarter than you. They have, the, you know, you have the same potential that they do, but you just haven't yet had a chance to really prove out that potential. So I am, I am concerned about your, your uh, choices, your school choices right now. Just a question here. So, like you mentioned, the leadership essays, like what can be portrayed there. So, can here, uh, as in the leadership positions that I would have held during my college days because like I was the first women secretary to be elected and I was handling the entire college at that time or like each year student counseling or extracurricular. So many leadership positions were, were held at that point. So that's in those, great. sorry. That's great, that's a great, that's a great start. Uh, but it's not, it's not gonna overcompensate for business experience. It is business school. So they will be looking much more heavily at your business, uh, impact. So I think I think you can. I mean, look, try, you've got nothing to lose. You know, as as the saying goes, you miss a hundred percent of the shots you don't take. Uh, you know, so if you don't apply, you're definitely not getting in. <laughs> if you don't even apply, but if you do really want to go to school in the U.S., I would consider, or maybe like apply to some of these schools in round one, see how it goes, and then consider applying to other schools in in round two. Um, 
But yeah, I, I, this is just my thought based on my user experience. I, I'm not sure that I, you know. Yeah, I think the people who get into those programs, they usually have a bit more concrete oomph to show. Yeah, so I completely agree with you, Maria. But uh, can it be like, in case you see my profile, rather than work X, anything else that can be improved upon to just increase the chances? Maybe some courses in product management, or maybe anything like when you see the profile, those things, if you could, like, little bit, you could lead up to me to that thing, to, to those things. Yeah, I think anything of, um, of uh, like leading other people or especially like identifying a new opportunity, like saying like, hey guys, like, you know, we don't have a, 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 a internal internet for a recycling program. Like the, the people who tend to, to get into these programs, they don't just simply, they're not simply good at their jobs, but they're actually actively looking for ways to improve the organizations that they work for. And so they're able to say, like for an MIT in particular, MIT really looks for people who are brave in their innovation. So the people who stand up and say, wait a minute, guys, why we, we're doing this all wrong. We need to completely change how we're doing it. And then senior management is like, what? No way, lady, we've been doing this for 20 years. And who are you to tell us? And then you convince them because you put together the presentation, you know, like that sort of story of people who sort of stand up to drive change that's sort of the, the kind of story that an MIT really looks for. So if you have any opportunities in your job in the next few months prior to applying where you can sort of, you know, be the person who stands up and says, we've been doing this all wrong or, you know, hey, guys, you know, why don't we have, why don't we do payments over SMS instead of, I don't, you know, I don't know, like, <laughs> or why don't we expand into Mongolia and become the number one pay, pay person in Mongolia? Uh, that's sort of a that sort of a thing where you can you can show that you've pushed the business forward. It, I think it will be tough to do in the next sort of three months before the round one. Happens, but anything you can do to start to show that that sort of internal push to to be a leader, I think you know it'll definitely help. Yeah, just one another question. Yeah, so in case, uh, I applied to round two rather than round one and have seven months to my uh, disposal. And uh, in that seven months, I am able to have such a project. So maybe round two applications would be better for me. Do you think so? And maybe a chance to get promoted as well. The thing is, like, even if you do get promoted, you will have only been in that promotion, that up, that increased title for six months. So I, it, it will, it will definitely help. I don't know if it would help to the point of a Harvard Wharton Stanford. Um, definitely, it would definitely help. And I, I do think looking at maybe you look at an NYU and there and you sort of talk about their fintech program and how you want to go into fintech and I bring this fintech experience even though I'm not, you know I'm doing the internet but that's fine you know like I've seen what they're doing on the fintech side and it's super interesting and now I want to do it too. Um, I think that would be that that might help sort of that story might come together pretty nicely. Oh, understood. Yeah, I think that's it. Okay, excellent. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Oh, so I see Abhijit. Let's do some questions. Do we have time for questions? Oh. <laughs> Thank you, Dushyant Kanduja. I appreciate you. I appreciate your your compliment. Flattery is always welcome, especially this early in the morning. How about people who have more than 10 years of experience? Will they still be accepted? So it is much harder for people with 10 years of experience to get accepted. Unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, you know, if you've only got two and a half years of experience, you're probably a bit too young to get accepted. And if you've got more than 10 years of experience, you're probably a bit too old. And the reason for that is that usually people at the 10 year mark are at a position of seniority where they don't really need the MBA. Like they've already gotten that senior VP position or they've already become, uh, you know, a senior executive. And so if you're like, well, I'm 10 years out, but I haven't become a senior executive yet, then the challenge is saying to the admissions office, the admissions office is going to be like, well, why haven't you been, right? Why haven't you accomplished where some of your peers are? So the, one of the challenges with the 10 year people is 
having like sort of showing that again, I, I know I keep saying impact, impact, impact. I know you're sick of the word impact, but really demonstrating that impact and that leadership experience and really explaining to them and thinking not just for the purposes of kind of fooling them in the application process, but for real for yourself. Why do I need this MBA? Do I really need the MBA or could I do something like a certificate in marketing or could I do a master's in data analytics, which is much cheaper, much shorter and much easier to get into, right? Like, um, so really ask yourself, right? Because the MBA, if you look at the post MBA jobs, they might be making, they might be more junior than where you are now, right? Sometimes I was actually just talking with my, my colleague today, we were talking to someone who was like a, we had a, a client who was already like a partner at a small investment bank and they want to apply to business school. And I said, but you already have the job that people go to business school to eventually get. So why do you want to go to business school to become an associate, which is like five steps down the ladder? Um, so that yes, people with more than 10 years of experience can be accepted, but really make sure that that argument for why you need this degree, because it's an expensive degree also, right? Why do you need to take one or two years out of your life, spend a hundred to $200,000 if we're talking about a US program? Like if, if you can build that argument and you can show that you've had the potential and that you simply didn't apply in the past, not because you were uh, not accomplished, but you didn't apply in the past because you were building a company or you were sort of like yeah, getting your company to a certain point and now you feel comfortable enough to leave and go to business school, I think that will help. So it's possible, but it is harder. Eight years of experience in the HR domain. I want to pursue a one year full-time MBA program. You left your last job in, so due to a career gap, it is hard to get into business school. Yes, uh, Pooja, I, if you have been unemployed, I mean, it's basically July now of 2020. So you had eight years of experience and then you have five years of unemployment. Um, I do think it's going to be pretty challenging because as you know, part of what the business school admissions committee is evaluating you on is, OK, who do we think is going to hire this person from our program? Uh, and so they're not just looking at you in a vacuum. They're looking at you through the lens of which of our employers who come to campus are going to want to hire this person. And so I think it will be a challenge because the employer might say, well, why was this person unemployed for five years? Now, there are many valid reasons to be for unemployment, right? Personal health reasons are the big one. Um, actually, health reasons are usually the biggest one or perhaps raising a family. So you could probably get into an MBA program, but it, I don't think it would be like one of the top programs. Maybe you could do, I think if you are in India, um, like I think some of the Indian business schools have uh, sort of like online, like I think IIM has like an online MBA or something like that, that might be easier to get into. I don't know how easy they are, but if you could sort of make the argument that like, look, I had to take time off for my career because of these personal reasons, but I want to get back into, into working and getting this MBA will refresh my skill set and will help position me uh, for a job. Maybe you could make that argument, but I do think it will be, it will just be, it will be challenging for, for a, like, a, like sort of when we talk about business schools, like the U S schools, like the Ross and Dukes and whatever, uh, it might be hard for them to think about like, well, who's going to offer this person, this person a job. So uh, maybe, maybe try to find something else besides an MBA that could help you get employed again as well. Like, again, like maybe a master's in human resource management uh, that might be available for far less money and uh, achievable in far less time. Jasper Isip, I love watching you on GMAT Club. Well, starting with a compliment always helps. I hope that the rest of your, I hope that I don't have to give you bad news according to the rest of your question. Aside from Indian engineers, what are other examples of overrepresented demographics in MBA applications? So the other overrepresented demographics are people in finance, uh, people who work in banking, investment banking, sales and trading, mergers and acquisitions, hedge funds, private equity, all of those guys, right? Because in most finance type roles, the MBA, this is changing. I think the MBA is becoming less and less necessary, but for a lot of people, it is sort of like a stamp you need to get in order to advance to become, say, a partner uh, at a bank. Again, this is changing, but since it is seen as such a necessity for people in that field, a lot of people in the finance industry, banking, finance, whatever, super overrepresented, 
uh, engineers are represented, and then uh, consultants, management consultants, strategy consultants, IT consultants, marketing consultants, tons of consultants. So when you say, well, what's the best strategy? <laughs> I'm going to use the word impact again. I'm so sorry. Yes, you're sick of impact, but it really comes down to impact, right? Because there could be, I think I was, uh, when I was speaking with uh, Vids earlier, who is, who is a healthcare consultant, you know, there are some people out there who are, let's say, healthcare consultants, who all they did was like, I consulted on some sort of documentation that made form X23556 easier to fill out. And so the actual, like it's a nice project, but the actual impact to the business is kind of teeny, but there's someone else who might be a healthcare consultant who was like, oh yeah, I helped Sanofi launch a new cholesterol drug in Africa and it made $3 million more than expected. That's someone who's also in healthcare consulting, but look at how big that, that whoa, that's a huge amount of impact. So when it comes down to like, oh my gosh, all these people are the same, or at least they initially look the same, it's going to come down to within that job, the job titles that are all the same, when we dig down underneath the job title, what's been that bottom line impact that you've been able to drive? And also as on sort of a logistical side note, on a technical side note, overrepresented candidates do often tend to need to score higher on the GMAT uh, in order to help stand out, right? Because if someone's a healthcare consultant and they helped optimize a CRM system and someone else is a healthcare consultant who also helped optimize a CRM system and one has a 710 and one has a 760 and I want I want to take one of them but I'm not sure what it will often it might just come down to something like the GMAT score so the overall kind of rule of thumb and this is not a hard and fast rule but the overall rule of thumb is that you're if you're from a very overrepresented group you're going to want to aim for about 20 to 30 points above a school's GMAT average their published average in order to be competitive of course, GMAT is not destiny. If you've seen one of my other videos, I did a video about an Indian engineer a few weeks ago here on GMAT Club who had a lower than average GMAT, but because that impact was so huge, it like, they were like, okay, fine. We don't care about the GMAT. Like just come, come to our school. And this person went to Stanford. So, but in order to balance out that GMAT, it was like, boom, again, this impact was like, I invented a new thing that's going to save millions of lives. And that's not really an exaggeration. That's actually, <laughs> this person could actually say that and not be lying. So, um, you know, so that's, that's how, that's another way to stand out. Shlovic here. Oh, hi Shlovic. How's your new job? I want to talk to you later and see how it's going. Shlovic just started a new job, everyone. Yay. Um, but yeah, zero for eight MBA. And I think you worked with it with like an expensive admissions consultant, one of the pricey ones. Uh, and you got into zero out of eight schools. And then you worked with Applicant Lab and you worked with me and you had much better results. So thank you for the shout out. I really appreciate that. Uh, you can reach out to me at support at applicantlab.com. Yes. Any final thoughts, Maria? Well, uh, yeah, I just, again, I think when you're from an overrepresented group, the devil is in the details of just how much impact you've had. It is far more important to show uh, interpersonal skills like persuasion, uh, motive, being able to motivate others, inspire others, persuade, convince others. That's more important than saying, well, I write the best algorithms. Because when you think about it, the admissions committee is not hiring you to be an engineer. They're not saying, well, we need an HVAC engineer to come and make the, the air conditioning system at our business school better. That's not the job they are hiring you for. So when you apply to business school, don't treat it like a job application where you try to prove to them, like I do a six sigma alpha 3.2 X improvement. Like don't focus so much on the technical aspects of, of your accomplishments, Focus on the interpersonal leadership that was necessary to make that change happen and focus on the bottom line impact to the company, right? So this allowed us to, you know, I was working with someone recently who, um, you know, uh, did some sort of very technical work. And I was like, I don't understand, you know, H273X controller with a microchip processor. I don't even know. But it allowed a large company to launch a new business. And I'm like, okay, don't even talk about the controller or the ohms and the resistors and the capacitors. Don't even talk to me about that. But talk to me about, oh, because I invented this thing, now this company is able to make more money. That is a language that business school readers understand. So 
focus on the interpersonal aspect and the bottom line aspect because don't work too hard to convince them that I'm super, super good at building software because that's not what they care about. And in the resume portion of Applicant Lab in the free trial, which anyone can access, I have a whole little video explaining why, for example, the resume you use for your MBA application is not at all the same resume you use for getting a job. This especially applies to people in technical roles because admissions officers are not engineers. They are usually people who worked in HR. So you're just going to lose them and confuse them. OK, so I think that is my final thought. Uh, and with that, I, I think I'm done. So I guess bye, everyone. Thanks for joining.